Right, today I'm in Surrey with John Henwood, um, well-known bookmaker, of course bookmaker. Uh, John, thanks very much for agreeing to talk to us. Um, for the people that aren't totally familiar with you and don't know all that much about you, can you tell us, well, basically, how you started in the game? Was your family background bookmaking? Uh, not really, no. Uh, to an extent, uh, my, both my mother and my stepfather worked for the Tote on course and in the offices at Euston. And uh, in the course of that, uh, in school holidays, I occasionally got taken to the races with my stepfather who was working uh, in the uh, in the tote uh, offices on course. Uh, that's really my first uh, my first uh, introduction to uh, a race course. Uh, that was when I was very young, but then when I was ten. Uh, my uncle, who was very keen on horse racing and liked to bet, as well as did my mother, um, they used to go to Royal Ascot once a year. Uh, he had a car, uh, I didn't know anybody else that had a car, and um, he used to come from Essex in his Hillman Minx and take my mother and him and his wife to, uh, to Royal Ascot, normally for the opening day. So my first day where, where I was actually not just not just confined to the tote buildings was uh, was at Royal Ascot. That would have been about fifty eight, fifty nine, uh, that sort of time. Uh, I can remember some of the races. I can remember, I can remember Doug Smith winning the Queen Anne Stakes, which was the opening race, then uh, on a horse called Amber Light. Uh, and as I say, I went for two or three years, probably between ten, eleven, twelve, that sort of age. And I remember another day when it rained stair rods uh, and there was a horse called, it was a French horse called Venture the Seventh. And I think it was about seven or eight to one on. And um, I said to my uncle, you yeah, know, really, this, this, uh, this seems ridiculous that you have to put down eight pound to win one. And I'll never forget his reply. Oh, he said, the professionals love this. He said, they, he said, this is already past the post. And because it duly won, I think it was a two or three runner race, then it duly won hard held. Uh, and I, that sticks in my mind. And another time it just rained so hard and I thought they can't possibly run this racing. It was steroids coming down and they did run. It was the last race. And I remember them coming up that straight in t absolutely torrential rain. And that sort of led me to start take taken an interest in the the money side of it because um, because my family didn't really have any money I noticed the bookmakers were very well dressed and I noticed they had very good shoes uh, there used to be a pen then we used to go in the inside in the middle of Ascot um, and there was a pen inside there with the bookmaker so it was free to go into the the Heath Ascot Heath but you paid you paid a small amount to go into the pen where the bookmakers were. My uncle used to take me in there. And that's where I first saw race course bookmakers operating. So I'd have been 10, 11. Uh, and I thought, I like the look of this. It, uh, they look like they, that they look this, they, I could see the cash and the money and it started to appeal to me as a possible means of, um, of exit from uh, Notting Hill, West Ham, where I was, uh, the slums there where I was born. Um, and then when I shortly afterwards went to secondary school, I went to Sloan Grammar in, um, in Hortensia Road, Chelsea, um, I started to think about the prospect of uh, accepting bets on the big days. So when the big days came along and boys were talking about the Derby or the Grand National, I very helpfully offered to, um, to uh, accept their uh, sort of wages in Thrupney bits and sixpences and shillings, that sort of thing. Uh, I suppose I was, I don't know if the word is entrepreneurial, but I was keen to uh, keep that going. So from the up, from the Derby, I'd carry on with the Oaks or vice versa. And then from the Grand National, I'd try and keep a bit more interest going. And there were one or two boys that liked to have a bet, you know, two or three days a week. So that's how I got into it. And then I got told off for it at school, obviously. I didn't, I didn't take too kindly to that. Sloan Grammar, and uh, I sort of got caught with a book with all the bets written in it. Um, but I, that, that's really how that germ of being a bookmaker started. 
Um, I, I then fell into it by a complete fluke. When I left school in those days, the first thing your, your, your parents wanted to know was, when are you starting work? And I'd applied for a job at the Board of Trade. Um, and my friend told me it was good there, and he said, uh, you've got some qualifications, you can go in as a clerical officer. He started off as a clerical assistant so I'd go in as a clerical officer, then I could get up to executive officer quite quickly. I don't think it would have suited me, but I applied, took the exams and the tests, and I got a letter saying, um, very sorry, uh, you know, you're not for us, or words to that effect. So I was a bit disappointed, and, um, and, then, and, then, and then my stepfather saw an advert in the Evening Standard for um, set, a settling course at William Hill. Oh, obviously, William Hill was alive then, in um, in Blackfriars. So uh, I applied for the advert out the um, out the standard, and I went to William Hill and uh, took an exam uh, involving just basic maths uh, and an interview, and they offered me a job. And I was due to start on the Monday, uh, and on the Saturday prior to the Monday that I was due to start, I got a letter from the Board of Trade. Dear Mr. Hamwood, uh, please report at uh, nine o'clock, so and so and so, to Mr. Brown to start work. Uh, and I went round to a telephone box, telephoned, and um, it transpired afterwards that they'd sent me the wrong letter initially, telling me I didn't have the job. They should have been sending me the one saying uh, I did have the job, and then they later sent me the details of where I was to start, but by that time I was committed to William Hill, and I, obviously that more that better suited what I wanted to do. My parents, I'm sure, would have preferred me to have gone to the civil service, but I don't think that would have lasted. And then I started at William Hill uh, as a trainee settler, which was like a classroom set up for about three months. Uh, and then you took various uh, interim tests until in the end you passed as a settler. You had to sign a three-year contract with William Hill. I started about six quid a week and it went up in regular in increments up to £22 a week, which let me say at that time was a, was a, good, that was a good salary, £22 a week. Uh, men used to think at that time, around about 66 it was, 65, you know, if you were getting 20 quid a week, that was, that was fair. So um, I worked at um, William Hill. Uh, that was an experience. Um, a lot of young guys there, a lot of young keen guys there, and um, all, sorts of, um, all sorts of shenanigans there, really. Um, uh, I remember the, the year that uh, Foynaven won the national. Uh, they ran us, there was various sweeps, and because I was a young and green, they sold all the tickets, and there was one ticket left in the, in the hat. So obviously, by process of elimination, they worked out, the operators of the swim worked out that the only one left in it was a no-hoper. So they had to find a mug to sell that ticket to, and uh, I put my hand in, and because it was Foynaven, which actually won the national, which was, <laughs> which was quite funny. Uh, I'm sure it was fine, Avon. Uh, anyway, I was there in I remember I was there in '66 when England won the World Cup. That was probably the first disaster for me as a bookie, because in there at William Hill, all the boys used to bet with each other, and uh, it was difficult to see England winning the World Cup. If you, if you watch their early games, they looked very poor, and they were about eight to one. I thought this looks easy money to me laying these. And because we know the rest, uh, it was pay, pay time. It took me about a month to pay. But uh, still got the scars, but we, we survived. And then at that time, um, there were betting shops opening all over the place. And um, the, the, you could get big money straight away as a manager. So I was getting, I'd now gone up to about nine or 10 pounds a week at William Hill, 11 per quid a week. But I knew that if I left and got a job settling in a betting shop, they'd probably pay me 20 quid, which they did. So a lot of their young staff left for that reason. William Hill were caught a bit, they didn't know what to do about this. It was a, it was a new development, with these shops opening. And William Hill was very anti the shops. He didn't, he, William Hill said these betting shops won't last. 
and he, he had two, and the only two he had were ones he'd acquired in buying Jack Swift's business, which was one in Hounslow and one in um, Dover Street, Piccadilly. But he didn't want to actually open or buy himself. And his staff were going left, right and centre to all these firms that were opening. So I, 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 I broke the contract after about two years and um, and went to work for in a, in a bedding shop in Wildstone. Um, and then I started uh, managing betting shops. Uh, from there I went to, uh, I worked for a funny guy, Danny Costell. Danny was sort of, he thought he was Robert Iyer's answer to uh, Al Capone, Danny. He thought he was a gangster. He was quite interesting. And um, he was a first independent bookie to have a, a chain of shops. You could see one or two or three or four shops, maybe a firm might have in an area, or even six or seven. But Danny had about sixty or seventy shops all over the country, um, and he was very innovative. He was a nutcase, but he was innovative. He had his own football coupon. Everything was the Q, the Q for Costell, the Q coupon, and um, I became pe peculiarly. I became a bit of a blue eyed boy on that firm for some reason, and. Um, I uh, I, be I started off doing um, relief managing, where the manager was ill or holiday, this sort of stuff. And uh, I did that for quite a while, traveling around all over the place, all along the south coast, up in the Midlands, Leicester. And um, eventually I, um, I, I, I rang uh, Danny and I said, I'm getting a bit fed up with this. Uh, I was in a f shopping chalk farm, no toilet, no water. It was, it was lovely. And um, he was good, Danny, because he had a copy of the Factories Act hanging up in the shop with all the rules on it. And um, he didn't even have a toilet or water in the shop. But that wouldn't have worried Danny. Um, so I rang him and said, uh, you know, I'd like to, um, I'd like a shop permanent. I've, the traveling's getting, you know, I've had enough of it. Oh, he said, I, I don't have a shop in your area. I said, well, you've got a shop in Pescud Street, Windsor, because I was living at Staines by this time. He said, but there's, there's, a manager, there's, there's a manager in there. I said, okay. So he said, well, leave it with me and leave it with me. I'll see what I can do. So uh, the next day he rang me back. He said, when you finish there, Chalk Farm, he said, um, go to Windsor Monday morning and ring me from the railway station. I said, okay, Danny. So... I went to the railway station at Windsor, rang Danny. He said, OK, he said, uh, right, go into the shop, sack the manager, uh, tell him you're from the head office and you're taking the shop over. I said, oh, Danny, I can't, I, I, that's not really my job. I, I'm managing the shop, so I'm not, I, that's not my, no, he said, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, just go into the shop and tell the, tell the manager to ring the head office. So I, do, I did that and uh, it, it, I got stand at the counter while the manager's ringing the head office uh, to get the bad news. But I was young and I suppose I didn't, I didn't care so much then, but it was awful really. And they slung him out there and then and I took the shop over in Pescud Street. And it was a big shop and it was busy. And Danny was funny, Danny was, he, 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 was, he was peculiar. And uh, I fell out, I, I, I packed up over a pound with Danny, uh, the shop there. Uh, it was busy, and while I was there, they started um, Hackney Dogs. Hackney Dogs started, and um, it meant now that uh, there was it was busy in the morning. So the the, the part time seller, I was allowed to pay him five pounds. That was a maximum, and I had a had a, had a mustard part time, and it was really useful to me. So he naturally got the five pounds. But now I wanted to come in an hour and a half earlier because of this hackney dogs are busy. So I, was, I had to give him something, so I gave him six pound. And you entered all your figures on a sheet, sent it away weekly. And after about three weeks, Danny rang me up. A Saturday, he said, this part time, you're paying him six pound. I said, well, Danny, I said, he's working extra hour and a half with his hackney dogs. I said, we're terribly busy here on a Saturday morning with his dogs. I said, I can't stand him coming an hour and a half early for nothing. So uh, Danny it was very volatile. He shouted down the phone at me, don't tell me what to do with my money. And I said, no, I can't do that. I said, but I can tell you what to do with your job. Uh, and that was the end of that. And, uh, and then the part-timer packed up at the same time. I come off the phone and Steve, the part-timer, uh, who's still a betting shop manager now, 40 odd years later, 
he said to me, um, he said, you packing up? I said, yeah, I'm packing up. I said, that's it. So he said, I'm packing up as well. Well, so the phone rang. It was Danny back again. He said, I've been thinking about what you said. He said, I can see where you're coming from. I said, well, no, I said, it's no good now. I said, he, he said, no, no, I want you to stay. I said, no, no, I'm going to leave. That's it. I'll leave it as it, as it as it stands. And I left. And it wasn't too long after that that I became drawn to... Um, become drawn towards making a book on a course. So Danny was a, was a bit of a volatile character in, in every respect. Uh, he was fond of walking into shops and sacking all the, uh, all the uh, staff at a moment's notice. If the shop wasn't doing very well, they'd all get the slickers and a new crew would arrive. And Danny was a bit of a gambler himself. He had pitches on the rails. Uh, he did a fortune but making a book on the rails. Um, uh, in the in the late sixties, early seventies, and um, he also used to like to go to casinos to gamble, which is not really recommended. And um, he uh, he started to frequent the casino in I think it was Queensway in London, and uh, it was owned by Labrooks, and um, Labrooks gave him credit. And uh, he, 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 he started to perform there for a, a, over a period of time. And he ran up large debts, uh, sort of 60, 70, 80,000 of debts. Now, Danny thought he had all the answers. And Danny thought that because gambling debts weren't recoverable by law, he thought he could keep giving Labrooks a story and um, they wouldn't be able to bring any pressure to bear because there was no legal means of uh, recovering the debt. So he began to give Labrooks the runaround, and um, what he hadn't remembered, what he'd unfortunately forgot, was that he was a licensed bookmaker. So Labrooks said to him, um, if you don't pay, uh, we are going to object to your, your, your bookmaker's license, which of course placed all his uh, 60, 70 shops uh, in jeopardy. And he couldn't pay. It was a lot of money in those days. I'm going back into the late 60s, early 70s, or mid 70s, and um, you know you could probably buy a Benny shop for two two thousand quid at that time, where you could, and uh, they they pressured him and threatened him with uh, objecting his license. As a consequence, he finished up giving Labrooks a lot of his best shops. They took in lieu of the debt, and Danny was never really the same after that. And that was sort of the. The end, of, uh, the beginning of the end of the uh, of the Quastar, Quastel Empire. Okay, before tying up the Danny story, there you mentioned uh, you started getting interested in on course, which is where most people probably know you from. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, um, well, I did have betting shops, um, which I sort of almost come across by accident. I'd worked for a guy in Surrey who had uh, managed some shops and he died. He only had three or four shops and um, I wasn't working for him when he died and um, his wife carried on and uh, she got into a pickle with the shops and she employed some managers that stole all the money and um, it the kind of story short, she got in touch with me and asked me if I would take the running of these shops over, which I did. Uh, and fortunately I was able to get them back onto an even keel and profitable again and got the debts paid off. And um, I worked for sort of, I worked for about half wages on the, um, on the premise that if I got the shops out of the, uh, out of the mire, then um, she could catch up with the wages uh, later because I liked her and she was always fair with me and so was her deceased husband. So, um, after about nine months when I got everything up on an even keel and going, she said to me, why don't you buy the shops? I said, that's a very good idea. I said, the only thing is, what do you propose that I use for money? Because I didn't have any. Uh, so she said, well, can you give me anything? And I had an old cottage in Cornwall, which was sold, um, raised a few quid. And uh, she said, you can give me something and owe me the rest, which I did. And I took the three shops over uh, I bought another one in Martindale Road, Hounslow. So I don't know, four shops. Um, but really, I started going to the races in, on sort of the quieter days, and that's where I really developed the ambition to be focused more on course. I enjoyed that cut and thrust, and it, it was a bit more exciting than uh, sitting in a, in a, in a betting shop. 
So I had a partner in the band, there were two of us in it, and um, anyway, uh, I decided to start uh, making a book, and the first place I made a book was uh, Westrum Dogs, which was a flap in Westrum in Kent. Only in the summer, with no light, it was held in a field, what they call a ball hair, which looks basically like the end of a mop that you'd use to mop the floor, and they dragged that up the field uh, on the back of a, on a cable attached to like a motorised bicycle or motorbike, and that, and the dogs chased the ball hair, what's called a ball hair. And it was on mid, one midweek day a week, in the, as I say, in the summer in the field. It was run by a big gypsy, and the office was a pan and lorry with the back down and uh, with straw on the floor. And um, I only ever saw him wear a denim waistcoat and jeans, nothing else, just a denim waistcoat and the jeans. And he was quite, uh, shall we say, formidable looking. And uh, he, he, there was an advert in the sporting life for bookmakers. Well, that's uh, to, to anyone watching this who's um, who doesn't really know. Um, if you see an advert in the sporting life or the, or the racing post, it would be now. If you see a, an advert advertising for bookies, that means one thing for dead certain. It means all the bookies in the world have been there and they've all packed it up because you can't win. But because I was young, eager, foolish, and I didn't have anything to lose, or very little, I decided to, um, I had to make a start somewhere and to give it a, give it a whirl. And uh, I, uh, I appeared at Westrum, uh, and, and curiously, next to me, the first evening I went there, was another bookmaker called George Reed, who I then later bet next to for uh, 33 years at Wimbledon. But uh, I started to make a book at Westrum with uh, my friend who was my partner then in the betting shops. He would clerk, he was a good clerk. And uh, it was about seven or eight races a night. And every possible way it was to cheat the bookmaker uh, was perpetrated there. Um, the race was up a straight. I, I don't know the exact distance. I would say it was about... It was probably about 250 yards, 300 yards straight. Um, the gypsy who ran it, I sort of became friendly with him, which was ne I needed to do because he used to advise me on uh, what was going to win the forthcoming race, which was very helpful. Uh, he would bet to massive figures to try and um, uh, try and get over the fact that it was definitely going to be crooked. But they did all sorts of things. They used to die the dogs. So, so the, the white and black dog that you saw run very fast last week would suddenly become the, the, the all black dog the following week where they put some uh, boot polish or something on it to dye it. And then better than that, one night I was there and there was a fast dog, quite a fast dog in trap five, looked, uh, looked at you know, a, a big odds on chance and uh, they took the dogs to the traps and um, took the dogs up to the traps, all of a sudden there was, there was a lot of money for the dog next to it in trap four. What I didn't know was that behind the traps they'd swap the coats on the dogs. They'd put the, they'd put the five dog on the four dog and reverse. So of course when the traps opened, the four dog flew out and that was the end of that. So there was quite a lot of, uh, shall we say, nefarious uh, goings on at Westrum. But in, it was a good grounding for me because I suppose after that, uh, I, I, I could, it was, it was only going to improve, the scrutiny at the other place was only going to improve. Um, and I enjoyed it, and at the end of the year, it was quite amusing, um, at the end of the summer came, and uh, the gypsy said to me, I'm, uh, I'm going to put on a, uh, an open race uh, for £50. I think the other races were like six or seven quid or a tenner. He said, I'm going to put on an open race for 50 quid on the last meeting. I oh, said, so that's very kindly. I said, I'm gonna bring a big cup. I'm gonna get a big silver cup, which I did. And I bought a big cup. I said, I've enjoyed it. And anyway, I came along. And the race developed into, like the betting, the race developed in like a two dog race. There was like a hometown gypsy uh, 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 outfit that uh, had the best local hometown dog in the West Room. Area and then there was an out of town gypsy mob that bought another dog that was also very good. So, as a betting from a betting standpoint, it developed into evens each or two between the out of town gypsies and the, the hometown gypsies. 
the other dogs were like would have been four, five, six to one. These sort of prices, you just take what you can out of those. And anyway, they took the dogs to the traps. The traps opened. The dogs burst up the field, and the out of town uh, gypsy's dog was about three or four lengths clear, about 150 yards from the line. When the ball hair, it didn't slow. It stopped. It stopped, and the dog, the the, the the out of town gypsy dog following it was just about to seize, got to near seizing the air when it when it suddenly zoomed away again, 400 miles an hour up the straight. Because by that time, that dog had lost its impetus, and the hometown dog zoomed past the win. So, because there was uproar, uh, the the out of town gypsies called foul, and there was oh, it was absolute pandemonium there. And in the end, the, the, the big gypsy chief that ran it got into the back of the uh, pan Tentican and announced uh, the winner is the, the hometown dog. And that was it. So I, I just paid out over that dog and uh, with his backing. So that was, that was the finality of, uh, of Westrom Dogs, which was quite amusing. Um, if we got any money, we used to stop on the way home at a hotel, have a meal and a couple of drinks and spend most of it until the next week. And from there I went on to uh, Point to Points was the next stop. I got a pitch at Lark Hill, which I really enjoyed. I enjoyed all of it, but I enjoyed Lark Hill, Badbury Rings, uh, and one, other, one, one or two other guest appearances at tracks mainly in the West. Some interesting um, occurrences there. Uh, I, may, I was at uh, Lark Hill and uh, the bookie next to me was a guy called Simon Smith, who had just uttered, oh, I, 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 I like him immensely, Simon, a good sense of humour, funny guy. And next to him was a guy called George Baker, who was a West of England landowner, really. He was a farmer, owned loads of land, who, who'd started out life as a punter. And because he had so many friends in that neck of the woods, uh, due to his uh, farming activities, he, he became a bookmaker. He didn't have a faintest idea how to make a book, but he was a nice guy. Anyway, I went there one day, about the second or third time I was there, and I had 40 quid in my pocket uh, to start. The first race, there were two runners. One of them had run five times unplaced. The other one had run once, unseated rider. And they bet in round terms, they bet two to one on the one that had run five times and about seven to four against, in round terms, the one that had run once an unseated rider. So I thought I've got to try and turn his 40 quid into something. So uh, I thought I'm going to go with the, I'm going to go against his favourite. It's run five times, it, 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 it's never been sighted. I'll take a chance with the one that's unseated rider. So I put the 40 quid in the centre uh, and I've gone, I've gone with the, the outside of the two. So they got down the back straight, and lo and behold, the, the, the favourite, the one I want to beat, that's fallen. I thought, hallelujah, there is a God in heaven. So anyway, mine's making the best of its way down the back straight, when it suddenly refu it, 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 it slows up going into the fence and slings the jockey over the fence to the other side. So... The, 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 one that's, the one that's previously fallen, the jockey's chasing after it, trying to find it. The, the other one's on the floor, so now there's no runners. So he's got up uh, from being slung over the fence, and miracle, he's caught hold of the horse. So he's got back on it, and then he proceeds to carry on. I thought, oh, this is getting better. So he clears all the fences. Meanwhile, the favourite, he can't catch it. He just gallops off in the direction of Salisbury, and he can't find it. So mine's come up the straight and uh, I've collected the money. So I thought, hallelujah. So I start to bet on the second race and they said, announcement, steward's inquiry. So how can there be a steward's inquiry? There's only one finisher. So I, I'm banging into the second race now. I've got to, now I've got to a bit more money in the in the uh, odds. So there's a bit of a uh, bit of fresh uh, enthusiasm there and. Um, Stewards in court, I forgot all about that, I didn't take any notice. And after about 15 minutes, it said, uh, uh, Tannoy clicked on, it said, the first race is void. So I thought, void? Why can it be void? Anyway, it was void because my horse that refused and slung the jockey over the fence 
when he caught the horse, he didn't go back and clear the fence that he'd refused at. So he never, he never cleared that. What he should have done was started before the fence. Instead of that, he started after it, and they declared the race for it. So I had to return all the money. So that, and by this stage, by this stage, I've now got the favourite in the second race for for like eighty quid, uh, which is duly obliged. So now I'm over broke, and I can't pay up. Uh, but that was nothing unusual. Uh, but. Um, George Baker, who was a very benevolent guy, uh, I said to him, George, I'm in a bit of difficulty here, and um, he lent me 100 quid, which was 60 quid more than I'd start with anyway. And, uh, and off I went and proceeded to, um, to, to recover some of, the, some of the cash. And George was always a very affable guy. He used to come with a big Range Rover, and in the back of it, he'd have loads and loads of food and drink, and he'd open the back, and all his customers would uh, avail themselves of his hospitality. And I used to do similar on some occasions. He was a very nice guy, and later became a customer of mine. When I when I later was on the rails, George was a customer. I always wore a brown bowler, brown bowler hat and a brown suit, and he always every single time he came to the races, he bet with me only, which I thought was very kind of him, and uh, I never forgot him. Uh, and anyway, I then went to a place called Catterstock. Uh, where it was so muddy that they towed me into the track. Uh, I'll never forget that. I think that was the year, that was the year that Rubstick won the Grand National. That was another disaster. There were lots of those. There was a horse called Cranefly that was owned by Peter Cadbury, who owned about 68,000 acres around there, and um, or something like that. And uh, this Cranefly was about five to four on uh, and I suppose it was all laid out for this race. Anyway, I went evens and uh, the track fell on me and uh, it, it duly won a distance and um, paid out the next favourite one. Uh, so now the tank's on empty. So I thought, what am I going to do? Anyway, it was the day of the Grand National and I thought, oh, that's, so I wrote the runners of the National up. Nobody else seemed to be betting on the National, so uh, I wrote all the runners of the Grand National up and bet better way on that. And I can honestly say, I don't think I knew that the winner was in the race, Rubstick. It was, it was ridden by Morris Barnes, trained by a fellow called Ledbetter, and nobody could understand afterwards because of his broad Scottish accent. And I took, a, I, I took a lot of bets, not necessarily a lot of money, a fair bit of money, but an awful lot of bets at, at Caddestock that day on the Grand National, and it was a complete skinner. So I was back in, back in business, courtesy of uh, Rubstick and Morris Barnes. Thank you, Morris, and thank you, Mr. Ledbetter.